Welcome to Secrets from the Scene, a show for local musicians who want to improve their music, grow their audience, and learn about Minnesota's music scene. If you're interested in talking about all things music related and meeting interesting people from our local community, you're in the right place. Welcome to Seekers from the Scene. My name is Stephen Helvig, and I'm joined today by Brandon Commodore here at Helvig Productions. I'm really excited to talk to Brandon. He is a multi-talented musician, a musical director, a producer, and a songwriter. He's toured with Sounds of Blackness, Mint Condition, and New Power Generation, Prince's former backing band. Currently, Brandon also is the drummer and musical director for Stokely. Heavy, heavy hitters across the board. He has some amazing experiences and some great stories and insight to share with everyone. Please welcome Brandon. What kind of music are you listening to? Does it make you feel? Does it make you feel? Cause that's how you know when it's something real. What kind of music are you listening to? Man, thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm glad you reached out because I've kind of followed you on Instagram or like known a little bit about you, but we don't have any mutual connections that I know of or, yeah. you know, like, which is, I think the first for me on this podcast, at least, gotcha. hopefully not the last. Let's start by just getting to know you better. Like, tell me about your background, you know, the early days. I've read a lot and, <laughs> and there's a lot there. So walk us through the childhood. It's worth starting there. Yeah, the early days. I grew up in a house that was always musical. My father's a drummer as well, and my mother is a vocalist. And so when I was a very small kid, they were both in the Sounds of Blackness, original members in the Sounds of Blackness. And so those rehearsals and those shows are what my first exposure to music and the music business and the music industry. And then like mid to late 80s, they both joined a, a new formed group at the time called More By Four, mm. a jazz ensemble that was, they caught fire here in the Twin Cities and suddenly were touring around the world. Wow. And so that plays a big part on how I'm able to dream and hope I can become a musician when I get older because I've seen the highest highs. You know, as a, as a young guy, they were touring Europe and they, for whatever reason, took my sister and I. I think I was five and my sister was two. We were in somewhere in Europe, uh, not the Montreux Jazz Fest. I don't remember which festival it was, but we got to catch Miles Davis uh, wow. on stage and he was walking by. And I just remember like the absolute pandemonium. Like people were so happy to see him and to be that close to him. It just reminded me of like tapes I would see of Michael Jackson, you know, just the constant like largeness of it all. And so having that and seeing that as a kid, that, you know, if anyone ever asked you, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be like? It was very clear for me what I wanted to do. Yeah. How could you not want that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is the childhood for me. It's rehearsals, studio sessions, concerts, backstage, all that good stuff. Now you did formal education as well, right? With yeah. music? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I w Before it was McNally, it was music tech. I studied there and my last semester there is the semester before they converted to McNally, which became the four year institute. But when I was there, it was a two year program. Mm. And uh, me and one of my very, very good friends, also a drummer named Eric Ballard, we were there together at the same time. We just pushed it to the absolute limit. We were playing drums all the time. We uh, were living in my, my family's house. So we had drums in the basement at all times. Like it was nonstop, nonstop. Yeah. That's the way to do it. If For you're sure. going to go to music school, is sure. to take full advantage of that. And 100%. Yeah. Do you feel like the connections you made at Music Tech slash McNally were worth it for you? Absolutely. And, and I guess I would say more so the experience than any particular connection. We all had to take a class called Contemporary Literature. Contemporary Lit was a class where one week you got the song, each department, so drums, bass, guitar, keys, and vocals. Everybody got a song that you had to learn 
and you worked on it in your principal. And then at the the next time you saw that class, we would have to perform that song. Mm -hmm. So we would, you know, and they would just kind of randomly pick someone from each department to have to go on stage and perform. Every week was a different genre. So if I can remember correctly, in that class we did, I remember playing Take Five. I remember playing Money. I remember playing one of the Bonnie Raitt records. So it was a wide variety of yeah. songs. And so I mentioned that because that class, I really feel prepared me for what would be the next steps in my musical career. Because after graduating, after leaving McNally, the next thing I did was join the R Factor Band, which is a huge wedding band here in town, especially during that time. Not just wedding band, parties, galas, they do, they do it all. But that book was 500 songs deep, right? Yeah. And a lot of different genres. And so I truly believe that the way that I was learning to prepare for that class is what I was able to carry over to that gig. How long were you in R Factor? Oh, man. R Factor, probably four or five years. Yeah. It was a, good, it was a long, it was a good run. The cover band gig mm -hmm. is a training ground. For, for sure. It. I for mean, sure. it is insane. Absolutely. You have to be really, really talented to do that. We had Ashley DeBose on a few, yeah. few episodes ago, and she is still doing that gig. And I, I like to bring that up because I find it is a great opportunity for musicians as a way to stay busy, yeah. keep honing their skills, make money, potentially even do some travel, all of that. Because there there can be kind of a negative connotation with with being in a cover band. For sure. Amongst original bands. You know, there's that yeah. <laughs> that's the fight. But I just don't really see the argument. As long as it is it's working for you and you have time to do the other things you want to do. I mean, man, having to learn five hundred songs, like you start to see patterns, you start to understand genres in better ways that you've Oh yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I think having to be that type of musician, it just teaches you more than the music too. It teaches you responsibility, accountability, mm. and what does that mean for a musician, right? Like when you have to plan your day around this particular gig or whatever, like if you got to load in at a certain time because the event starts at a certain time, just all of the different things that go with it, it just really teaches you professionalism, right? Yes. When I was running around with the R Factor, we had to wear tuxedos mm -hmm. to every gig, even the bar gigs, right? Yeah. And so for us, that might have been like, oh man, but- for the band leader, he, w he was very well aware that the people who are coming to this particular bar have a wedding they have to plan next year and da da da. So I w it was always like a commercial, you know? He was yeah. always thinking that way. So big, big learning. That was almost like an extension of, of school for me. Absolutely. The professionalism that's involved in being in something that runs more like a business than a lot of local bands do. That's huge because it starts to show you what you get when you do that, like yeah. how that builds on itself. I want to come back to that. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to come back to that because I know that you and I want to talk about some mindset stuff and, sure. you know, from the little bit of time that we've already talked, even hanging out before here, I can tell that that's a strength of yours in terms of like <laughs> your, your mental fortitude, your ability to be professional, to take things seriously, to think ahead. But I want to stay on this journey right now of, you know, your sort of progression through time up to yeah. this point. So you start in the R factor. What happens after that? Yeah, so during my time with the R Factor, so we're we're somewhere around, I'm going to struggle with the time period, but I know for sure we're like, we're around 2005. So this time period around 2005 and 2006, I'm still playing with the R Factor and the drummer for the Sounds of Blackness at the time, they were parting ways for whatever reason. And I remember being at church, I was playing at church, heavily involved in my church at the time. And he was there and... We were talking and I'm like, so what happened, man? He was like, oh, you know, it's just time to do something different. But, you know, if they need somebody, you should put your bid in. And I'd never considered having a shot. One, he had had the gig for a long time. And the drummer before that had it for a very long time through the Grammy run and the, the tours. And the drummer before that was my father. So I never knew how I would get there. So just off of that conversation, by him telling me, take a shot, I reached out to the director, Gary Hines, and I said, hey, man, I don't know if you're still in need, but I'd love to play. And he and I had a rehearsal in my basement the next day. Wow. <laughs> he hit me up. And he was like, man, thank you for reaching out. You know, your reputation precedes you, and um, let's, let's check it out. And so within a couple of weeks, I had the gig and had to do my first fly date, which was in Houston, Texas. 
from there that we did their annual Christmas show. Every December, they, the Sounds would do, you know, a string of dates at the Guthrie Theater or at the time of the Fitzgerald Theater, actually. Mm-hmm. So I started preparing for that, and that was that. So a lot of other things are circling at this time, though, is my point. So R Factor, Sounds of Blackness, enter this band called Just Live, okay? So two very good friends of mine, Courtney Richards currently lives in Los Angeles, California, and another buddy, Beef. They had a rap group, and they had decided that they were going to only use a live band now. They didn't want to just mm-hmm. do the DJ thing. And so some other friends of mine were playing with them, and I found my way to a rehearsal, and it just worked. And so I became their drummer, which suddenly became I was the, I wouldn't quite say the music director yet, but that's kind of what I was doing, like leading the band in rehearsals and making sure the other musicians knew the music. And, you know, so that starts being tour ready now. That starts me understanding how to run a show, how to program a show, how to take things from the studio, get it into the computer and now perform live. All of that starts with that band. And so I'm doing all of these different things at the same time. So this is a full on hip hop band. Sounds of Blackness and then R Factor playing, you know, Sweet Caroline every night. And yeah, yeah. So it's a wide variety. And so playing wise, it was a big growth period for me because I had to be flexible. I had to be well versed in different styles. And I couldn't take my playing style from Just Live to Sounds of Blackness. And I couldn't take Sounds of Blackness to the R Factor. So I was having to be different things. And so that just kind of, I felt like that built my muscles up, which obviously led to a mentor of mine, obviously Stokely Williams. He would kind of hit me up for some cover gigs uh, that he was doing around town. If he wasn't here, I would cover his uh, Afro-Cuban jazz band called Johto. And so that just kind of started to plant the seeds. One day he hit me up and said, hey, you know, we're, we're getting ready to do some auditions. I need you to come through. So and that starts that whole journey. So, but that little bubble where I had all of those three different things going on, that is literally what prepared me for every single thing that I'm doing right now. Yeah. 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 I mean, multiple genres, multiple playing styles, multiple responsibilities. Yeah. What a training ground. And then when we also, so with that too, when we talk about being a professional, you know, how do you handle when two of those bands have a gig on the same night? Oh yeah. How do you handle when rehearsals are the same and you can't do something like How do you learn how to navigate that as an adult and as a responsible person, like taking the, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or like, because it's not about any of that. How do you still take care of business? Like, so that was also training ground for that as well. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's break down some of this. Mm -hmm. First one quick question before I forget it, the Stokely Williams as a mentor. Yeah. How did you guys actually connect? Was it just because you were out playing shows and he knew you from that? Or was there other? No, not from me playing shows, but from him being around town. There are a lot of great musicians in the Twin Cities, yeah. some not so accessible. And, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I just mean they have what, you know, they have their bubble and they do what they do. And that's not always in the public eye. And so... The first time I was introduced to him, I was maybe eight or nine years old. I caught him. My father saw him walking around a a Juneteenth celebration in North Minneapolis, which we would go to every year. So I saw him there and I remember him like, there's no way that's the guy I've been seeing on TV. I can't believe it. Right. And then as I got older, I would start trying to catch his performances and the different things he was involved in around town. And so me and my guys, man, uh, who I mentioned earlier, Eric Ballard. And Barry Alexander, who was Johnny Lang's drummer for quite a bit of time. We were relentless on finding Stokely, Michael Bland, and, you know, Jelly Bean. Like, we were, mm-hmm. we would find out where these people are playing, and we would go there. So, to make a long story a little bit shorter, when I was graduating high school, my parents knew, my father knew that Stokely and Larry Waddell, keyboard player from Mint Condition, Jeff Allen, saxophone player and keyboard player from Mint Condition, a bass player named Serge Aku, and this old school cat percussionist named Wallace. They had just started this little Afro-Cuban jazz band. And so they hired those guys to come play at me and my best friend's open house when graduating high school. And so that day really kind of solidifies the relationship and starts the starts the keeping in contact. So I got his information and he was like, well, we're going to be playing every Monday night uptown at Wallace's place. Wallace had a shop on a Lake in Lindell at the time. 
And so we'd go down there and hang every Monday. And eventually he started calling, you know, one of us up to sit in. And then we'd just start like, I would start hitting him up all the time. Like, hey, man, what's going on? Where you at? Want to come through? Hey, man, what are you doing? Da, 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 da. Like, yeah. And then he would start mentioning, yeah, man, I want to get you these men condition rehearsal tapes. I want to get you, we're going to need an understudy or something for, yeah. for Chris Dave. Eventually, years later, that came true. They were getting ready to go back out on the road and start promoting an album. Oh, you know, you know what? Let me back up. So like going to those Monday night shows and I would start to sit in and we were still at McNally at the time. And so we would call him up and he would come by up to the school. We'd get in the practice room and we would just play drums for hours. Or he would come by the house. Like one of those nights he was playing with his band. It was a Tuesday night at the spot called Bob Lou's, which at the time was across the street from Bunkers. Okay. So they would play there every Tuesday night. And this was a very, very cool hang. You never knew who was going to show up. Other acts who would be in town playing the Dakota or something like that, they would come by after their gig and hang out with Stokely and them guys. And so one night after we were down there hanging out and we told him, yeah, man, let's, let's go to the house. Let's go play some drums. He was like, sure, sure, sure. Nothing happens. We try it again the next week. Like, yo, man, come through. And uh, he's like, all right, I'm going to pack up and I'll see you all over there. And we go home and we start messing around, make sure the house looks okay. <laughs> yeah. And we're playing, and suddenly we get that knock on the door, and it's got to be 1.30 in the morning by now. And, uh, yeah, we played drums almost until the sun came up. And he was in there wearing us out. Like, we were trying all type of stuff. We were just going for it, man, like a real, real shed session. And so that is really the big blessing for me in, the, in that relationship is the time that he spent with me in my early 20s, just yeah. on drums. And, and he wouldn't just let me just play, you know, aimlessly. He would stop me and say, all right, that's cool. Try it this way or think about it this way. When you're playing, like he was really kind of what I believe now. He was molding me for, you know, for something. That something became giving me a shot in an audition with the world-renowned Mint Condition. That's such an awesome story. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad that, that we dug into that a little bit and got yeah. that journey because you took the steps necessary for that to even be possible, right? A lot of people just think or hear stories. Oh, okay. Let me back up. A lot of times in these podcast interviews, it's the quick brief cut down version, right? Yeah. And it just sounds so easy. Like, yeah. And then I, and you know, then I had Stokely as a mentor and right. <laughs> and it's like, well, wait, hold on a second. You, you know, right away. First thing is you skipped the whole long journey of yeah. the fact that you put in years of effort, years of trying to make a connection, years of showing up, going to shows, being yeah. where you needed to be, all for just the possibility of a conversation down the line. Yeah. And it worked out for you. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes those things just stay, you know, maybe a mutual connection, a friendship and things right, like that. Right, Sometimes right. they blossom into something very serious. It doesn't matter. Yeah. The point is, is you were willing to put in the work and the time and do the things that needed to be done for something like that to happen, which yeah. did really reap a lot of reward for you. But still, still years of showing up, that's what it means. Yeah. And I think people often don't get that story enough. Yeah, it, man. All right, let's jump ahead to a little bit of where we left off in your journey where you were in three different bands, mm -hmm. all doing different things. But one of the bands sort of forced you to become the musical director. It sounds like it was kind of like out of necessity that you needed to play more roles in order for that to be successful? I would, I, I would change that a little bit. Okay. I wouldn't say that I was forced at all. I don't even think, I wouldn't even say I was asked. <laughs> I would say that me becoming um, a music director happened very naturally. I think it happened on purpose for sure, but I don't think it was intended. I don't even know how much it was needed at the time. More of something you exploring, saying, hey, this would be cool if we added more of these elements to the... It just started becoming normal to me. Okay. It started to become very regular to me to say, uh-uh, hold on, hold on, that's not how this goes. This goes this way. And also, you know, one of the leaders of that group, my friend Courtney, who I mentioned, Courtney and I were spending a lot of time together outside of the studio. Like, we were hanging out a lot. And so, or even just the time I would just hang out with those guys in the studio when they were making the music, which I was not involved in at the time, although I desperately wanted to. I really wanted to be a music producer at that time. That's what I cared the most about. But anyway, so 
I just knew how the music was being made and I had that relationship to understand what they wanted. I knew very much what the two of them wanted from their band. Mm. And I've had countless of experiences around rehearsals and different directors and how these things are run. And when I talk about the R Factor being a learning ground, also the leader of that band is Emil Campbell. I learned a ton from on how to run a band. And the same thing in the Sounds of Blackness situation, being on tour with those with those folks and watching Gary Hines have to navigate leading the group on stage, but then having to be responsible for the meet and greet after the show. And I was kind of shadowing him in those things like, all right, Unc, I set this up for you over here so you don't have to worry about it. So traffic can go this way now. Last night we got killed and we did that. For some reason, all of this stuff started mattering to me. And that's when I knew, all right, this is something more than a musician for me. Yeah. And so in those Just Live rehearsals, it just was important to all of us. We were trying to make the best show anyone has ever seen. And I was just doing whatever I knew to do, whatever experience I could bring, whatever tools and resources I could bring, I would naturally do that without being asked. And then I think eventually they noticed, like, hmm, we might have someone here who can do this. Like, it wasn't ever something that we thought we needed or knew we needed. Like, we were just yeah. going for it, you yeah. know? And so I think it very naturally happened because that's what I was supposed to become, not specifically for that band, but just that's what I was working towards without even knowing it. Filling a need that you yeah. felt like was there, yeah. Let's back up one step and mm -hmm. explain to people that may not know what is a musical director. A musical director can be many things, right? And I've had to learn that only because when you work for an artist who makes their own music, like there's no, you don't musically direct Stokely Williams, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and it, we're playing his music, so no one can tell anyone else how that's supposed to be played like he can, right? Right. So in that scenario, in the scenario of Stokely, I am not in charge of the direction that the music goes in. I simply have the assignment of making it sound how it's supposed to sound. For me, that really, it was important who was going to be playing with me. And so when he sat down and he was telling me about, you know, going solo and he was asking me, you know, all right, so who are we going to get? And one, I was honored that he would even ask me that because he could call anyone all over the country to put a band together, right? And so I really took that serious and I didn't want to just like call my buddies. I wanted to really get people who I thought would show up and then people who understood my language, you know, understood my speak so that when we're in these rehearsals, we can get to work. Like, cause my thing is I want to do the work. I love rehearsals. I can do that all day long, all night long. MPG rehearsals are like, 10 to 14 hours, mint rehearsal would be the same. Like mint rehearsal, they would show up with their own lunches and all like, it was the duration, right? And so to answer your question, a lot of my roles are organizing rehearsals, scheduling with the band and the, and the musicians, figuring out a time to get seven people in the same room at one time, you know, making sure that the Dropbox or the Google Drive has everything they possibly could need to be prepared for that rehearsal. And, and just really knowing the music, like, I think more than anyone, I have to know the music. And that might even be true, but that's what I tell myself. I tell myself, you have to know this music. You got to know the bass part, the guitar, the horns, all of that stuff, because that's just kind of how I take music in. In order for me to learn the song, I have to learn the entire song. I can't, I have to know what everybody else is doing kind of to make sense of what I'm doing, if that makes sense. That's the gist. And I, and I, I, with Stokely, also a big part of what I do is trying to keep sound checks as efficient and pushing forward and, and all of that stuff. So I'll be the one, you know, kind of quarterbacking sound checks as well. So those are, that's the majority of my roles and responsibility as music director. Does that also connect into live shows in terms of coordinating tracks and stems and things like that? Oh, does it ever? Yes. Yes. And so to tie it all together, that is what started uh, with the Just Live Band, right. which was different from the sounds and different from the R Factor because we would just count a song and play it in an arrangement or follow the chart with R Factor, et cetera, et cetera. But with Just Live, we were starting to run backing tracks, which was a brand new thing for me. And so we were getting all of that together. And that's when we, I started buying my own gear in terms of like, at the time, we everybody was using the Pro Tools, the Inbox. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, just getting all of that stuff together and how to make that mobile how to take the studio and bring it on stage with us. 
starts with that group and even more so with Mint because Mint was running a small amount of backing tracks at the time when I joined, which eventually grew into a different thing and eventually became my responsibility, which was welcomed because I'd already been doing it. So I wasn't no stranger to it. And so the same thing with Stokely now, like I am fully in control, not in control, but responsible for all of the programming for the show. Yeah. So it sounds like the musical director is ultimately the leader for rehearsals. Yeah. When that comes to scheduling, how they run yeah. and making sure people are effective in the yeah. rehearsals. And then that bleeds into the live show, making sure that the shows are, the sound check is efficient the tracks are ready to go and that the show goes off without a hitch. Yeah, exactly. And it sounds like some of that flex can be, you know, in certain groups, perhaps you're a little bit of like the group's producer at rehearsal in terms of how the parts are going to be done and potentially with other groups, Stokely being one option or one example where, no, he he's in control of that, but you're making sure that yeah. the rest of the members are staying on task. Yeah. And being an MD is really, that role can change depending on what you're doing, right? So the, the music director for a musical or a play has different responsibilities, you know what I mean? Good than, point. Than I do. And, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, but just me personally, as a musician, I am always in this mindset of not being good enough, right? Mm. Or not being enough. And so for me, even outside of the music, like, I'm always trying to prove that I am, right? And no one said this to me. No one's told me I'm not. No one's made me feel this way. This is just, that's where I start naturally. And so with that being said, that is what has always pushed me to do more than the drums. That's what made me learn Pro Tools, which made me learn Ableton, which made me learn Logic. And so it's tough to say like I'm a music director because to be honest with Stokely, it's music directing, it's show programming. I, I got my hands in a lot of the production. And not that he ever necessarily asked me to do so, but just in my quest on learning more and being able to do more, I am now able to do these things. So it's a lot more than just being an MD, right? Because like I said, that the programming of the show, we started at a very low tech production. You know, we had a computer that was running a few tracks. But now we've switched over to Ableton and it's like another brain on stage. Right. right. Our Ableton session is not only spitting out the backing tracks, which everyone hears in the house, but it's also sending out MIDI cues across the stage. So it's controlling another computer that's on the keyboard rig. It's controlling the computer that's on the bass rig. Like it's pretty intense right now. So we've gone a little bit far. Yeah. <laughs> How do you learn those skills? Oh, man. So specifically with Ableton. I had to do a lot of homework because one, I I was not familiar with the program at all. Yeah. I was a logic guy. And when we started, we were doing main stage, which was familiar to me because I was doing that in my own band. I was doing that with Mint. Like I was, I knew main stage very, very well. And so learning Ableton, I had to start from scratch and uh, that was a journey. So I reached out to my buddies who I knew, I already knew. Um, there's another guy here on, in town. He's a studio engineer and producer and guitar player, worship leader. His name is Zach Fody. I know Zach. Yeah, so Fody came and got me to a point to where we can at least start rehearsing with the tracks in Ableton. So mm -hmm. he came and got me set up. And so I learned my first chunk of stuff from Fody. And he's been a very good friend to me over the years, by the way. I actually just talked to him a week ago, just talking mixing, you know, mm -hmm. like he's always there for me. So yeah, so Fody came, got me right because I needed some of the tricks. I needed some transitions and things like that that I just didn't know how to do. I mean, from there... Ableton kind of caught fire, right? And so now there's a lot of YouTube tutorials. A lot of people are explaining how to do mm -hmm. the things. Mm -hmm. And so I did a lot of that. And I also joined a group called From Studio to Stage. Shout out to Will Doggett. And that offers like basically some premium content on how to really do these things and how to step up your game with programming and inside of Ableton. From studio to stage. From studio to stage. Right. Is what I'm going to find that link for people. Because I think, I think yeah. there are people that are just are overwhelmed by... Oh, yeah. Where do we even begin with the live performance kind of production here to take it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not everybody's necessarily ready for that because it is a, a lot of work to get to that point. But mm -hmm. if you are in one of those groups or perhaps you're playing a role where you are musical director and you want to be able to offer more of these things to the people oh, you're yeah. playing with, this is a great place to begin. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'll say it one more time from studio to stage and you can find 
Will Doggett and that, and that group, you can find them on YouTube. He does a lot of free content, but he also has this subscription-based program where you can join and, you know, learn all the ins and outs. And, and that's everything from how to set up Ableton as a keyboard rig, how to run backing tracks, how to control lights, how to control sound, like how to send MIDI, all of that stuff is in there. Oh, great. And so I learned almost everything that I'm doing now, the way that our show runs from yeah. that experience which has been wonderful, wonderful for me. So now I could, I could retire from drums or, you know, and program shows for people just from those experiences. That's awesome. Yeah. What do you think is the most important attribute or skill for a musical director to have? Oh, that's good, man. Um, I would say one, you have to be able to people very well. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you have to be able to kind of disconnect how you feel you should be treated as a person and understanding that you're doing a job. You're in a role and you have a position to play and you have to make everyone comfortable with that. You have to make everyone around you comfortable with you being the quote unquote leader and them following you. Right. Some of the people that I play with, Johannes Tona, for example, was a f phenomenal bass player. He tours with Stokely. He also tours with Corey Wong. Mm -hmm. I mean, but he's played with a wide variety of people like Jeff Lee Johnson, the guitar, like his resume is insane. So there's no reason on paper why he should have to follow me. You know what I mean? But I think the respect is mutual and he understands as a professional what my responsibility is. And I'm, he knows that I know I'm not there to be his boss. I'm not there to tell him how to play. I'm simply there to lead this team, and help make sure everybody is cool. Right. And so it's really that is, do you have the knowledge, the understanding and the resources to make sure everything is cool? Yeah. It's not just about being the best musician oh, in the band God, no. or anything like mm -hmm. that. And I think that that's something that, you know, newer musicians need to hear Yeah, that it doesn't matter necessarily if you're the primary songwriter or the lead singer correct, or the most talented musician that's shredding on your instrument on stage, who can lead and who should be leading is a different decision from 100%, those things. 100%. And, and it's different based on what you do, right? So keyboard players who are MDs, they have a different reach. They have a different ability, right? So they can add parts to the show. They can say, I'm going to put a line here. So and they teach the guitar player the line, da, da, da. Me being as a drummer, I'm not a multi-instrumentalist, right? So I, I can play piano a little bit. Um, I tried to teach myself to play the bass. That lasted for like two weeks. Okay. So, <laughs> so I have to rely on these people for that. You know, I can tell my keyboard player, I said, Dave, I need something right here. And we've been playing together for 20 years. So he knows instinctually kind of when I say right here, what's happening, he can assess and he'll know what I, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and we have that relationship where if I ask him nine times out of 10, he's going to play kind of what I want to hear. And it's the same thing with the bass player, Johannes. We've been playing together a long time. And I know his musicality. I know his instincts. And so if I say, I need something right here, I can describe what I want and he can deliver that, yeah. right? And so that's where I would draw the difference, right? And if I can just kind of go off for a quick second, like I would speak to that because you kind of get intimidated as a, as a drummer sometimes. It's tough to be one, seen in a role of leadership or doing anything outside of the drums. We don't really get considered for that as often, and so for me, it was, it was seeing people like Questlove, right? Like I went to, a, to see the Roots play. Mm. We were in, in Chicago for a Just Live show. And we happened to catch the Roots playing at DePaul University. And I remember we were like, man, this show is crazy. But I'm like glued to Questlove. And he had a microphone here and he had a microphone over here. And he would go back and forth and I could hear him in the house, but I couldn't quite make sense of what was going on. And I realized this is for us to hear. This was for the band. So he's directing the band and singing background parts and doing ad libs and all. So that blew my mind. And then to bring it full circle for me, when we talked earlier about people in town being accessible, right? I knew every Monday night I could go down to Bunkers and see Michael Bland play. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when we talk about mentors and, and we talk about the relationship that I had with Stokely and him pulling up and playing, we also had that with Michael Bland. Michael Bland made himself available to me and my friends, my, my drum crew. And he would say, all right, let's, let's meet on this day. And we will go play 
or we would go down on Monday nights and see him play and he would have one of us sit in. Like, so we had a great relationship with Mike too. And he did a lot for me. And so anyway, speaking of Monday nights, watching him count the songs off, watching him say, oh, not like he, he was just in control. And that spoke a lot to me. That said, Mike has perfect pitch, by the way. Mike is a multi-instrumentalist, so he, I've seen him play bass. Yeah. I, and I know he does more. So anyway, that opened me up. And it told me that I can do more. It told me that I do have a voice, even being a drummer. And so all of these things that I was feeling and caring about and wanting to do or wanting to say, it gave me permission to do it. You know, those things, especially Mike and especially Questlove, taking their their example that's what gives me the the strength and the confidence and the courage to do what I'm doing now. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I want to shift the conversation, I think, based off of that last piece to mindset stuff. Mm. There's two things that have come up in conversation that I find interesting. One is that at an early age, you're exposed to people performing and touring and recording at the highest levels. Yeah. You know, Sounds of Blackness being Grammy Award winning. Mm -hmm. You know, your parents are in that group. So right away, you, as a child, I've got to imagine that you're thinking, yeah, this is possible. You know, like your sights are probably set higher than the average musician just because you're exposed to more of that. So I think yeah. that that's, it makes it feel more real probably. Mm. But two, being around all of those people on the other side of it, you've also said that you constantly have a feeling that I'm not quite good enough yet oh, yeah. and I got to keep working. So there's, both sides of that coin, right? You feel like it's all there. I can do this. Look at all these people I know that are doing it. And at the same time, I don't feel good enough to be here. Right. The imposter syndrome kind of thing. How have you managed that? Because it seems like it's generally been, you've done well with it. You're successful. But is there a dark side to that? That's been tough to like, has that ever prevented you from making progress? Ooh, prevented me from making progress. That'll be tough to say, right? So it has stopped me from doing certain things. Yes. It can be crippling. So there's lots of gigs that I never auditioned for, mm. you know, which at today, I wouldn't change anything. I've made peace with all of that. But I can, you know, be honest and admit that not getting on the plane to go to those auditions or not putting my name in when I could have or when I was asked to, it was fear that made me not do it. So there is a dark side. There is a, there's a very, um, there's a very lonely side to it. And, and so what you learn, and it can be difficult to overcome these type of thoughts, right? Because, I mean, let's just look in the last 10 years with Instagram and YouTube. Oh, yeah. And the amount of eight year olds that I can go search and find who can play. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So you got that coming at you every day. Right. And I, I'm a grown person. I'm an adult and still have to be like, man, look at this kid. I can't play like that. So, yeah. So you, you I think the human it, it's human to to deal with those type of thoughts. But, man, I, I I have nothing but gratitude and I truly feel blessed. I mean, just to even sit here with you today and be able to say, yeah, you know, I used to call Michael Bland. I used to call Stoke. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, to people me. are going to listen to this and be like, how could you ever have imposter syndrome? <laughs> but that's that's how this works. Yeah. There's always somebody that's better than you. For sure. And you will always keep comparing yourself to other people and looking up. I did a whole episode on the comparison trap. And yeah, I, I dug that, by the way. Yeah. It's, it's a real thing for everybody, no matter what level you're at. You're always looking around and thinking about, well, this person's better than me. And, you know, yeah. and that's tough. And you know, what I would say, one of the most recent lessons that I've learned, and maybe some of y'all watching what I've already, you know, maybe you've already experienced this and dealt with it. But to me, it's right, like understanding, especially in the, the director leadership kind of role, you learn that how well a person plays has very little to do with it, right? And so recently, I'm just thinking like, I realize it is not about whether this person can play well enough or not. In a group scenario, in a band scenario especially, it's really about the fit, right? And so even with Stokely, we've made some personnel changes from when we first started. And it's not that those guys couldn't play. They're off doing great things right now, you know, but it was just all about the fit. And is this the right person for this particular thing? And so not being good enough for one thing or not getting an opportunity for another you know, you maybe just didn't fit that. But it's not about 
your talent. It's not about your ability. And so when we talk about being mentally tough and, and just, you know, maturing in your ways of thinking, because it, 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 what we do is no walk in the park. No. You know? And to be in this business, you have to understand a lot of who you are and when you have to show up as that person versus when you have to just be a person at work, mm. you know, and that that's a big difference. And then this is a whole another thing, too. When you're in this business with people you care about. Oh, man, when they tell you don't do business with friends or family, musicians, we blow that out of the water. We skip right past that. We start bands with our closest friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and that's a lot. Yeah. That is that is a lot to deal with, right? Especially when you asked like about the earlier about being, you know, being a music director and what those roles are, right? So when you're an MD in, in a band with people you really care about, mm -hmm. one of the biggest lessons I had to learn was how to navigate situations where those lines are crossed and blurred, right? And so what I would say to anyone who's willing to listen is if you're in a scenario where your friends or family with the people you are doing music with, you really, really have to learn how to approach it from the, with the right hat on. So if you're late for a rehearsal, if you have to miss something, you can't send that personal text like, bro, my bad, I ran out of gas and the diapers and da 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 like, the band leader does not need any of that. That is not how you would communicate with your leader at any other job, right? Mm. Same thing uh, on, the, on the flip side, right? As a director, a band leader, or whatever you are, when you receive these texts, how are you going to answer now? Are you going to reply as the band leader or are you going to reply as the homeboy, right? So right. are you going to say, oh, dude, I totally understand, and da, da, da. Like, where are you, how are you going to show up in that situation? So to make all of that make sense, it's about boundaries and knowing when to be able to have to make it clear which one we're doing at the moment, right? Mm. So if you are the person who needs to send that, I'm going to be late text, you got to decide if you're sending this to your friend or if you're sending this to the music director. I want to dig into this a little bit more because yeah. I think this is a an awesome tip for people. Yeah. Let me start by asking, do you pick a tone and then stay with it amongst that group or does it fluctuate? What I mean by that is, all right, let's just use Mint Condition, for example. Mm. You know that Mint Condition rehearsals are always with that tone. It's not about being friends, being understanding of that. It's no, everyone has a role to play here and you're expected to show up, be on time, do your thing. And then that tone is just there. So it never gets confusing. So then when right. rehearsal's done, you can go back to just like, yeah, hanging out, being friends with those people. Yeah. Or does it, does it go back and forth? It's going to go back and forth and, 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 it, and it's going to be a case by case situation, right? So let me put this together real quick. So you know, we've already covered the mid 2005 to, you know, about, let's say 2008 ish, right? Or let's go all the way to 2010, right? And so at this time, that band Just Live is done. They have moved on to different things. And so now Mint is my main thing. Sounds was kind of far in between and I wasn't doing Art Factor anymore. And so with all of this time on my hands and Just Live stopping, my buddy from that group, hits me up and says, yo, man, regardless of what happened with Just Live, I still want to do music with you. So me and my close friends, we started a production group. We were doing all of the things. We were making music and buying gear. We eventually built our own studio uptown. And I mention this because this is what leads to the band, as you know it now, it's MPLS. Mm. It starts from that conversation. And so we were running the studio uptown and... We weren't necessarily interested in like just kind of like finding clients to come book the studio. So we we're trying to figure out how we're going to make sure we can pay our rent all the time at the studio. And so we decided, let's just perform live. We'll go do a show and then pay rent. Boom. So I reached out to Bunkers and we started this relationship with Bunkers. We became a, a cover band down there. Um, and at the time we were called the Boombox. Mm -hmm. Quick short story. We were performing as Boombox. We were getting ready to play at the Caboose in Minneapolis. And there was another act also coming to the booze called The Boombox. And we were getting emails like, yo, what's going on with this show? And I'm like, that's not us. And then we got a cease and desist letter oh, no. from the other band. And one of the guys was like the nephew of somebody in the Grateful Dead or something like that. So, okay. 
So they were lawyered up, lawyered up. So we stopped being boombox, and that's when we became MPLS. All right, and so we started writing our own songs. We became artists. And I mention this because that group was full of people that I love. That group, my sister's in that group. My close friends are in that group. My new friends are in that group. That group was built on the hang, right? It was the way it felt when we were all together. That would propel us on stage, right? Okay, yeah. And so those relationships mattered more to me than the success of the group, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, and so with that being said, approaching that group was like... I, I, it was it's just a hang, you know, and, and before we would start every show, we would go, all right, potluck on three, one, two, three, potluck, because everybody brought something different, a different background, a different style, but we loved each other and we were a group. And so those lines for me, like I was never able to, I wouldn't try to like be a super professional bossy type tone with those people. It didn't happen. You know, now that doesn't mean like in rehearsals, I, I was still the person that would say, oh, oh, no, that's not how it goes. Let's do it this way. All right, do it again, whatever. Like, I was still that, but there was never any time where I could be like, man, y'all know how we're supposed to do this, da, da, da. Like, I just, that wasn't that. And I wanted to sometimes, you know what I mean? But that's just not the way we were designed. And so, which is completely different from how I would have to be in any other scenario, right? It sounds like it's ultimately just about good communication skills. No matter what communication skills and knowing your people, knowing your people, knowing your people, knowing how to lead those people. I've worked with people who, if I said, Hey, let's try that one more time. And this time I would like for you to play it this way. That person hears it as I suck. I'm terrible. He doesn't like me. Da, 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 da. They hear it different than how I intended it. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't think that I've ever been loud or aggressive or you know it, it's never been any of that for me from from my perspective but people have received it that way mm -hmm. you know and so knowing people is and knowing your people is really really important because it it teaches you how you handle them like i know this person over here i can say x y and z to this person i can't say it that way i have to change that mm -hmm. so that has been a big, big part of how I have to lead is kind of just person by person. They get their own style of leadership, you know, especially when you're friends with these people. Yeah. Not everybody's going to react the same way. People need different management, need different leadership. That makes perfect sense. Is that something that has come naturally to you over the years because you've sort of watched leaders do this and you've learned from them? Is it something that you've learned by making mistakes and then just reflecting on it? Not necessarily from other people, because honestly, I think it I think it's newer. I think it is more recent, you know, falling in line with the times. We're way more conscious of mental health now than we ever True. have been before. Right. And so like one of the things I constantly compare it to is like growing up playing like football. There's YouTube videos on this stuff like those coaches. God, the stuff that they say to these children. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. It's abusive. It is abusive and it's aggressive. And I can't imagine walking into a rehearsal talking to my friends that way, yeah. right? But my friends leave rehearsal as if I spoke to them that way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it's been, it's, there has been situations where I'm like, these people don't know what what it's really like, right? And so when I say it's more recent, it's because if you catch rehearsal tapes of James Brown yeah. or you know any people from that era. The way that bands were led and ran back then is we wouldn't make it. <laughs> we would not make it right now. Yeah. The state of, you know, the mental state of a musician right now, we're fragile in comparison to what those guys and, and, and girls had to endure. So I do think it's a new thing and it's not necessarily something I learned from mistakes. What one of my biggest takeaways from being a music director, again, as I mentioned, with people that I care about. And so it mattered to me how I deal with these people. Yeah, The relationship outside of the music still matters to me. And so having to navigate that, I think, is really what kind of made me learn how to, you know, step back from how I feel about whatever situation and then just kind of try to understand where this person is at. And that's kind of the, the gift and the curse. 
because I know my friends and I know what they're actually going through. So I can be understanding, Mm -hmm. you know, but sometimes the flip side is it's unfair to ask that of me knowing that I'm the person in this position to lead, but you want me to, you want me to ignore all of the things that I'm supposed to do because we're, you know, because I know what you're really asking me to make exceptions that I'm not making for everyone else or myself. Exactly. Exactly. Which is tough, but you learn, you learn, you learn how to navigate. And so that's why I think, like I said earlier, it's know the people. You have to know the person you're talking to before you can say, follow me. You know? And be able to just have effective communication. Maybe that's going to be amongst the entire group to set a tone when, when that needs to happen. And it might be one-on-one occasionally of like, listen, yeah, you know, we have to talk about this thing and I understand your situation, but this is where it's at. Like we have to, you know, being able to fix a problem if, if one arises. 100%. I, I, I'll share this real quick and I, I won't say his name because I'm not sure how he would feel by me telling yeah. the story, but I had a band leader, you know, I was maybe, let's say 20, 21, 22, something, somewhere in there and i um, living on my own and music was all I was doing. And I was starting to take gigs outside of that band that I was working for because I needed more money. Mm-hmm. And it came down to, I would sub that gig if I had a gig that paid more. Mm. And he was offended and he did not appreciate finding out that I was subbing his gig to do something else. And one, what I dig, what I've learned from that is he didn't bash me about it. He didn't fire me. He didn't do, he didn't do any shenanigans. He simply called my phone and said, let's talk. What's going on? How many bands are you playing with? (laughs) Yeah. I remember having to say to him, man, I got to pay my rent, man. I got to make money. So if another gig comes up, that's offering me a certain amount of money, I'm going to take it. I don't mean any disrespect to you. I apologize, but that's where I'm at right now. And he said to me, as your band leader, your bills and what your, that's none of my business. (laughs) And at the time, I thought that that was wild, wildly inconsiderate and all of that stuff. Yeah. It blew my mind that he said that to me. But he further explained. He said, I understand needing to make money. That all makes sense. But that's your responsibility. My responsibility is to run this band. And this band runs on its players being committed. And you said you were going to be here when you signed up. Right. And so we had this conversation, he said, and, and to make matters even worse, as your leader, you could have talked to me. You could have said, here's what I need. You didn't even give me a chance to counter offer to say, I can pay you more on this one because there are times where I can't. And my young brain, I'm thinking, well, then you should have. Yeah. <laughs> you <know? laughs> right. If you can pay me right. more, then pay me more. But I mentioned that because. I think it's very, very real and very powerful that he was able to have that moment with me. And from that moment, I think I learned a lot too, like how I am with the music director too. Like I have to draw those boundaries. I have to be able to say, I understand what you're going through, but we need to separate that for a moment. If there's ever a time where you need to be late or miss something, here's how you have to handle that. And then on the offshoot, you can say, you know, me and you can hang out and you can talk to me about your problems, but the time when we're all at rehearsal and it started 15 minutes ago and then you text me the sob story, that's not the time for that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like we can do that before or after. I got a lot from that moment and it and it it taught me how to handle my business as a musician. It taught me how to separate as a leader, you know, without being a, a jerk about it, you know, because mm-hmm. he was not mean to me in that conversation, by the way. So I take that with me a lot. Like the personal stuff, like that's just none of my business, you know, as your leader. That's not my concern. You have to deal with that. I also have my own stuff I have to deal with and I'm here, you know. So, yeah, I, I kind of lost my train of thought, but I wanted to, I did want to get that story out. I think that's a great story to share. Yeah. And if you're in a, a new band, right, maybe you're just starting to play shows. You may not have an official music director at this point yet. Everybody mm-hmm. might be just sort of working together and figuring it out. But I think that a lot of times somebody sort of emerges as the leader and is sort of organizing things and running 
And I just think that if you find that that's you, that it's important to to listen to those kind of stories and to really think about how you are leading so that, yeah. that your group stays together, but that you can be as effective as possible and stay friends with these people after perhaps this group dissolves or if you know somebody moves away or for any of the myriad of reasons why yeah. bands end. As long as you can stay professional when you need to be professional and friends when you can be friends, things will work a lot better for you. Yeah. 100%. On the mindset conversation, let's shift a little bit over to mindset of a performer versus mm. a, a director, musical director, because yeah. you've stepped onto some big stages and had high pressure situations. Talk a little bit about what's going through your head, particularly maybe at the start of those, of those experiences where you, you start stepping on big stages, big audiences, you know, high pressure gigs. What have you done to prepare yourself mentally, and maybe even more than that, maybe just even for those gigs, whatever comes to mind to be successful on stage? Yeah, that's a good question, man. Preparation is what makes me comfortable. I don't like that feeling of going on stage and not knowing what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't like that feeling in rehearsal. So to me, it's, it's the relationship that you have with learning music and so for me, like when we talk about the Mint Condition gig, right? So I started with Mint in May of 2000. And I think Chris Dave had just did a show in, with them in April. And I don't know if you're familiar with the drummer in town. His name is Brian Kendrick. Brian is one of my lifelong mentors, not just on drums, but just as a person. I love BK. And uh, BK was doing the Mint gig. He was subbing Mint dates up until I started. And I, I remember he said to me one day, he said, be imagined showing up to a gig and there's 150 drummers in the room all expecting to see Chris Daddy Dave. <laughs> and then you go up there and you got to do your thing, right? So going into my first gig, I had that conversation in my mind. And so anyway, wh what I know saved me, what made me comfortable to sit down in that chair and play that gig was my relationship with the music. Um, now, obviously they have plenty of live arrangements but I don't think there's anyone on the planet who knew the music more than me. I've been playing that stuff for years growing up. I would practice to their albums, all of that stuff. And so to tie in that contemporary literature class, to tie in the R factor, knowing the music is where you gain the confidence to just go up there and play, right? And I mean, you know, everyone says the cliche stuff like practice makes perfect or you talk to your favorite hero and he says, just got to practice. And then we all know about the 10,000 hours. It's very real. The more time that you can spend preparing yourself for whatever situation you want to be in, the more confident you're able to be, right? So I might not be insanely creative with chops and drum fills. That's not the type of player that I am. I may not be a lot of things on drums. Like, we, like you mentioned, there's always somebody better. There are. There are better people who auditioned for that gig but I got it, right? And so I used that and, and I took that and said, I'm here for a reason. Whatever that reason is, I'm here. And I got to get on this plane and I got to get on stage and I have to show up. I made sure that I was ready to play the music because that for me is the only way that I'm going to be able, be able to settle and not have to worry. Anything else can happen. We could be playing on a stage that's on fire, but we rehearsed yesterday, so I'm cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know these yeah. songs, I'm ready. Like that's what it is for me. That that calms all the nerves. And I was plenty nervous on that first gig. Plenty nervous. I mean, I remember even just in rehearsals, my first couple of mint rehearsals that were like official rehearsals outside of the audition phase. I remember on the very like the intro music, the first three times we ran the show, and then the night of the first show, I broke a stick. Mm-hmm. In my right hand, playing the bell on the ride cymbal each time because of how much like adrenaline and force I was putting into play. Wow. Zero technique. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was just all like force for no reason at all. But it was my nerves, yeah. you know? And I broke a stick the same way four times. And I probably haven't broken four sticks in a year's time span, but I did. So, I knew how I had to chill, how I had to swallow it down a little bit, and then it just got easier, you know? Yeah. 
But for me, it was always like when you know the set list, when you know the tunes, and, or, or even talking about that band, my band MPLS, we would play better if we spent a lot of time together leading up to the show. And so we played a show in Chicago at the House of Blues, and we drove down the morning of. So we were in the van for eight hours. We got to Chicago. We went and had uh, a late lunch together. Yeah. We went and did a sound check, and we had a phenomenal gig. Yeah. And it was only because of the time we spent together. So, yeah, like, it, it's just a lot of different things that, as a performer, you learn who you are, how you function, and you have to settle into these routines, right? One of my buddies, I mentioned him earlier, Eric, like, he had a, a pre-show routine that he would do, little exercises and stuff, and I always thought it was funny. It was hilarious to me. But now... I look at it like whatever you do, like just having something that you do to get you where you need. I think that's dope. Like, yeah. It's very, very smart. I, I would encourage anyone to, doesn't matter what your thing is. Don't listen to what other people's thing are. Just figure out what works for you. What's going to get you to be the, your best self when you sit on your instrument. Yeah. And I got lucky because for me, no matter how nervous I am, like I said, one, the one thing that's going to be for sure is I know the music. I'm never going to be on stage not knowing. That's just not how I roll. But two, as a performer, that moment of when you've just been announced and whoever's counting off, whether I'm counting off or I hear the slates in my ears, that one, two, three, four to start the show, that is my favorite moment in music. Like the way that that feels, the anticipation of starting the show. I fall in love with that moment almost every single night that yeah. we play. Like, I love that. The payoff. Moment. The payoff, yes. Yeah, like, that anticipation and and you know you're prepared and you know this is going to be good or you're just going to try your best, whatever. Like, that one, two, three. <laughs> Man, that's my favorite part. That's my favorite part for sure. Ah, that's so great. How about on the same topic, have you dealt with getting constructive feedback? Because along the way, of course, you've gotten constructive feedback. Yeah, boy. How do you process it? Do you have that initial, you know, little... <laughs> oh, okay. listen, it's going to sting no matter what. It's going to sting. And, I, and I, I've told this story. I have no problems telling it, right? So we talk about Michael Bland being one of my mentors. If you know Michael, he's very honest. He's a straight shooter. And... At the time, at this time of my life, he was calling me pretty regularly to cover for the combo. Mm -hmm. I remember shooting him a message, an email or something after one of them when I said, because I hadn't heard from him. And I said, so all right, how'd I do? And he said, well, apparently you rush on the choruses, especially when you're jumping over to the ride. Your tempo fluctuates. Until you fix that, I can't have you back up there. Wow. Yeah, man. That was like a ton of bricks just falling on me. But I respected I respected him for letting me know. And it's specific. It's very specific, which is great, mm -hmm. right? Because now I know what to do. That's real now feedback. I know what I, yeah. Exactly. That's real feedback. And I would assume that a person who doesn't say that to me doesn't care. I'm not even here to say whether he cares about me or not, but he cared enough in that moment to let me know. This is what it is. And I dig that, man. I dig that. Mm. Now, obviously, I had things to work on. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Like, I, I, drummers and timing, I could talk about that for hours, by the way. But I, I appreciated that type of feedback, you know? And same thing in, with the Mint gig. You know, having to settle in and, and, and play something. Oh, I, actually, let me, let, me, let me run back. The playing with Just Live. That was like my gig. There was no other drummer at the time. Like that was my thing. And that gave me a lot of freedom. I mean, we were playing along the tracks. And so the tempo was always locked. You know, we were playing to the click. All of that stuff was already in place. But uh, for a brief moment, we had two guys from in, in the band. Uh, one is Justin Charbonneau, guitar player, mm -hmm. and Ian Allison, bass mm -hmm. player. And the shows that they did with us, they one of them, they pulled me to the side and said, yeah, man, dude, you're great. You're awesome, man. Some of those feels are killing. But I want you to, like like a real pro player, I want you to be a real pro player. So just, I want you to play the same thing every time. Figure out what that setup is going to be, and let's, let's make it the same every time. And at the time, I didn't know how to take that. Because I, I was already on the mint gig, and so it was like, 
I knew how to settle down. You know, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. knew how to have to play parts. I was a part player, but apparently on the general, maybe I was wilding out. I have no idea, but that threw me for a loop at first, just, you know, cause they told me right after a show. So it was like the high of a show and then it just kind of came crashing down. But seconds later, I'm like, yeah, I do need to get it together. Right. And from that moment, like I was a lot more intentional with how I was approaching, like you know, as a drummer, you know how to, okay, this is the end of the verse. How are we going to set up the chorus? There's got to be some sort of fill. It doesn't have to be crazy lightning fast or anything, but how are you going to set up the next section, right? Which is a responsibility a lot of drummers take. So I was a lot more intentional, a lot more thoughtful playing the music and not just playing drums. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's been plenty of moments of, of constructive criticism and feedback from but me. But that's emotional maturity because you're able to then take something, a comment, a critique, any sort of feedback and get better. Yeah. That's what happens yeah. if you can be emotionally mature versus just reacting and fighting and arguing. And I think that for some people that happens more naturally, probably based on how they're raised and how they communicate with people. But you know, everybody can learn that. It's common to have it sting, like you said, to have it right away go, uh, just don't respond right away. Like process it. Think about it for a moment and think, well, is there a point here? Is there something to be learned? Right. And, and because if you study, right, what whatever it is you're doing, I've had a huge interest in recording and production. Mm -hmm. And so I started studying other drummers, musicians who also do that. So when we talk about Michael Bland, Michael Bland is a very consistent player. Yes. Right? And, and I saw someone else mentioning that about Steve Gould yep. on, on, on the last episode. Right. And so knowing that these conversations are happening, knowing and first and recording engineers are a drummer's nightmare for that. Like if you can't handle feedback, don't talk to a studio engineer because <laughs> they wear drummers out, by the way. And so knowing that I know, and then I'm starting to record myself in my studio. And so I could go back and look at the tracks and see where my discrepancies are. Yeah. You can see it. If you can't hear it, <laughs> you can see yeah. it. If you don't feel it, you can see where yes. I played the snare louder here, softer here, all of that stuff. One of the great things about recording, just to interject real quick, yeah. is how educational it is for that reason alone. 100%. And so, yeah, my point is, as they say, the recording is the most honest thing. Like, you have to record yourself. If you're a band, record your rehearsals. If you are practicing the shedding on your own, record it because you will hear the things that you can't feel in real time. And that is where you learn. That is where you're able to grow. And honestly, it's how you get introduced to yourself, you know? because it's like holding a mirror up, mm -hmm. right? And so if you don't know who you are, if you don't know how you are, just record it, <laughs> just record it. I would say that that is a big, big, big part of the learning is having these tools and these resources. Because now, whether you get any feedback or construct like these tapes and you know, they, people put you on YouTube and reels, you know, at your shows and all that stuff. So it's there. Yeah. <laughs> it's there. Yeah. It's there. It is. And it's an underutilized way of self-educating, I would say. Yeah. Obviously, there's there's people that are very active recording and things like that. But the amount of times I have clients in the studio that watch and pay attention and or ask like, hey, is there something here that you're seeing that's consistent? <laughs> you know, yeah, it's rare. It is yeah. rare. There's not a lot of people use that opportunity, which is fine. Everybody might have be on a different journey and be thinking about what they want to get out of it. But if you're serious about the self-improvement and growing your musicianship, growing your ear, being able to hear the little differences, the recording studio is a great place to do it. And also, you know, audio recording, but video recording yeah. your shows too. So you can think about your stage presence and, you know, how entertaining you are, how, how yeah. the jam looks, that sort of thing. Obviously that matters more in certain genres and certain audiences and that sort of thing. But it's good to do regardless. If you're on stage, know that you look good being on stage. I think a big thing that I would say to anyone is you have to be very clear about what it is you're trying to accomplish. Like if you're in your early 20s and you decide you want to be a musician or whatever, like whenever you know that you want to be something in this, 
you got to get clear about what those goals are going to be because that will d- determine the path you need to take, right? And so I say that because a lot of artists, and now maybe not so much now that we have so much information available on the music business and how things are working, um, but I- I've just seen over the years a lot of artists make the smallest mistakes just by not having the correct plan, you know? And all of that stuff that we're talking about, it matters to a certain extent to me. And I'm, I will not be of the popular opinion on this because like when we talk about Steve Goat, he's a monster musician, right? And his level of consistency is great if you want to be a studio player, you know? Sure. His level of consistency is not what is absolutely necessary for you to be a good touring drummer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah, they're different things. So, so there are different things. So I would just really get real about what your focus is. Mm. If you want to make records, then yeah, you want to make sure you are crossing your T's and dotting all your I's when it comes to your performance. You know what I mean? We used to talk about this all the time in my band. We would try to, we weren't looking for a record deal. You know, we weren't looking to get signed. We wanted to play shows and kill these shows. We were trying to get more into the festival thing and all of that. So we didn't spend a lot of time like just hanging around in the studio, for example. We rehearsed, you know what I mean? So it's just like, or an artist who, I I hear people say, oh, uh, maybe you've heard this over the years too, people who used to want to make, you know, get their song on the radio. You know, I want to hear my song on the radio. Then what? Right. Right. So now you've made a song for the radio. And then what? What do you do? You know? So it's like just knowing what you're after and then it gives you a whole blueprint of things to study to get after that. Yeah. You know, that's really what I've, I've been doing at honestly at the expense of my musicianship. Like I don't have as much time on the kit anymore, like just practicing and refining because I'm on the computer now. I'm writing songs and learning a lot about production and I'm just starting to like mix my own stuff now. So it's a whole nother world for me now, right? And I don't have time to sit around and bang the drums like I used <laughs> yeah. to, you know what I mean? I would love to. I'm doing a lot more now than I have been, but you know, it, these are the choices you got to make. Absolutely. It's a timely conversation given that we're at the end of the year here because a lot of people will be setting goals and be thinking mm-hmm. about by the time this episode comes out, we'll we'll be into 2024 a fair ways, but be clear about your goals and then set intentions of you know, what you're, how you're going to spend your time making sure that those line up with your actual goals. It seems simple, but a lot of people don't actually follow through on, on all of that. Yeah. I have another probably hour of questions for you on, on the, <laughs> on the producing and the recording side, on the sync side. I, yeah. we're just, I'm going to have to have you back for that. I want to ask you one more sort of mindset kind of question before we wrap up, because I think this is such a relevant real life thing for a lot of people, which is how do you deal with planning for the future? when it comes to being the type of musician that you are, which is, boom, tomorrow you're flying to Arizona, I think, right? You're doing tours with different groups. You have your hands in sync world. So you have income coming in in different places. You're doing some teaching, but it's always like, well, this opportunity comes up. I'll take that. And this, you can't plan for for a lot of that. So how does it, how do you go about figuring out the future, financial planning, all that kind of stuff? Because you are successful. I mean, a lot of people are going to look at you and go, you got it made. But I want you to talk <laughs> to talk to that and how life is affected by that. Oh, man, that's a big one. One, you have to be adaptable, have to be willing to and able to pivot in order to plan a future. Right. And then again, as we just discussed moments ago, identifying your goals and then the intentionality behind them. And then you kind of got to examine, not necessarily a plan B, but what are you going to do if this step, if step number five doesn't work, what are you going to do to still make sure you can get to six and seven, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, that is always changing. I have not been able to say by the end of this year, I'm going to have this, that, and the third. But I have gotten in the last two or three years post-pandemic I've gotten a lot better by about establishing my goals. Like right now, my whiteboard, I have the projects I'm working on, what's already completed, what are my big goals, what do I need to do today? Like, 
So just planning out the day or the, the week ahead is a huge help for me. You have to be very real about what it is you're doing, right? And, you know, one of the things that happened for me during the pandemic was, you know, more time on social media and being bombarded every day with this hyper productivity. You know, even now, like I had to accept I am not a content creator. So now what am I going to do? Mm, right. Mm -hmm. Because we are in the era of content and it's readily available. At, you know, oh, yeah. you know the game. Right. And there are things telling you every day. If you don't do this, you're not going to be successful in the music business. You know, and I'm not here to say that that's right or wrong. I'm saying I know that I am not on my own able to record my video, edit my video, post my video, and sustain that. I can't do that by myself. I'm, that's not the guy that I am. Yeah. That's just not where I'm at. You know, my daughter wouldn't, will not allow that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I have to identify what I can do, right? And so I could easily go back and get my job at Amazon, for example, but that's not who I am. I was able to transfer my leadership as a music director and go run a team over there, but that's not what I do, right? And so I have to dabble in different things. I am teaching, I am writing and producing for TV and advertising, and I'm performing as much as I possibly can. And man, I saw this guy, there's a drummer named Diamond. Diamond just finished Beyonce's Renaissance tour. I saw a clip of him yesterday explaining this idea that people have to see things around seven times mm -hmm. before they yep. before they even think twice about it, right? So as a musician, a, a writer, any, any creative, you have to put yourself out there over and over again just for someone to even consider the idea that you might be available to do what they need you to do. And so that kind of registered with me. Like I'm not getting ready to start running ads like drummer for hire or anything because I'm not looking for that. But I am going to be more intentional with my relationships and, and that I already have and letting them know like, yeah, I'm down to do stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm down. I'm down. And it might not be playing. It might be like, yo, man, I'm fully set up to record at home. What do you need? Like, mm -hmm. I'd love to play on your stuff. Mm -hmm. Just building some more of that and not letting, you know, that fear that we spoke about earlier stop me. Yeah. Yeah. So how to plan for a future. It really just looks like you one mapping out your goals, right? And then kind of determining what is really obtainable. Like what's real, you know? It's good to dream. That's great. Start there. But like what can we accomplish today that will lead to tomorrow, you know? And then the people around you, your support system, your family, your spouse, you know, what are they up to and how are they able to contribute to your success as well? How do you rely on your family to help, you know, carry the load? Like that that matters too, yeah. you know? And maybe you're young, maybe you're fresh out of high school and in college by yourself and trying to figure it out. So maybe you don't have that type of support system, which is, it's still doable. You know what I mean? And so I think as we talked about earlier, it's just getting real about goals, man. Goal setting and accountability, accountability and being task oriented. Right. And that's for me, I, I don't really enjoy sitting still like days off are usually miserable for me. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about like the dark side, right, like catching up on my couch, which I use about, oh man, Tuesday, I get to just kind of chill, watch some TV. And then five minutes, I'm like, what are you doing? You got thousands of dollars of equipment downstairs and you're watching millionaires on TV. Right. What is wrong with you? Like, that's what's going on in my head. So, or like growing up, my parents were touring the world, both maintaining day jobs, still gigging locally. Never missed a band concert, never missed a basketball game. My sister was involved in cheerleading and track. Wow. They, they did all of that. Exactly. Bro, my mom, forgive me, mom. My mom is 70, about to turn 72. She gigs as much as me, <laughs> if not more. Okay, my mom is still doing these things. When we talked about that band, MPLS, we were playing every Wednesday night at Bunkers. At the time, my mom was doing hairspray at Chanhassen. Mm-hmm. She brought the entire cast down to Bunkers one night after their show. And this was on a Wednesday. So on Wednesdays, they had a matinee and an evening show. And she still brought them all down and they danced till one in the morning at Bunkers. And I haven't even gotten started on my father. Like, <laughs> so 
that type of hustle is in me. That work ethic is installed, instilled in me and my sister. And so if I'm sitting around, I think about my parents like, you know, my daughter's like, daddy, can you play with me? And I don't want to. Yeah. I go back to your parents were touring, working, still made it to every basketball game, every band concert, all of that stuff. So that's what kind of pushes wow. me. Learning what it really means to set a goal, get task oriented, and then make a plan and just day by day, even if it's finding 10 minutes in every day, 10, 15 minutes every day of something that leads towards your goal. You know? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for making time for this conversation. I've enjoyed it so much. I Man, I hope we got to all your stuff. <laughs> I, I, I get to run in my mouth. Man, <laughs> no, and, no. And it was, just goes on and on. I, I definitely have more I want to talk to you about. So I'm going <laughs> to, you know, in the future, I'm going to have you back out here and we can do this again and, and dive Word. into the other stuff we missed. But I really appreciate you sharing all that. I think it was really, really beneficial. At the end of all these episodes, I've been asking people what their secret is to the scene. You know, you've been a, a local guy here, huge success. If you had to boil it down to something that, you know, one important tip that you want to leave to the younger generation, what would you say? There's so many. I know. <laughs> it, could, it could relate to, since so much of this has been on mindset and leadership and relationships, communication, it could be in that department or if something else comes to mind, but anything. One thing that I would say, remember that you are a human being. You're not a machine. You're not a workhorse. Those ideas are antiquated. I am team productivity. That's what I thrive in. But it does not mean that I don't get tired. Does not mean that I don't get sick. Does not mean that I don't have emotional challenges that I experience. Remember that no matter what you do, you're still a human. So give yourself grace. Give the people around you grace. I think that will make a lot of things better, right? And I will really briefly just touch on, I, I was watching Trevor Noah on Netflix and he was speaking to, in America, we identify ourselves by what we do. So if someone says, tell me about you, you say, oh, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Nowhere else in the world do they identify themselves as what they do. Right. So my name is Brandon Commodore and I'm a cool person to hang out with. <laughs> I love documentaries. I love grilling. That's the human. That's who I am. And I would tell everyone to start there. Remember who that person is at all times and take that with you into your rehearsals, into your production meetings, into your business meetings. Take that person with you, even if you have to wear a professional hat. Brandon has to be a professional. There is not Brandon and the professional, if that makes sense. So remember you're a human. Thanks for sharing. If people yeah. want to connect with you, follow you online, hit up a show or anything like that, where do you send them? Yeah, right now I wouldn't really have anywhere to send you. I'm on Instagram, I'm yeah. on Facebook, but 2024, I have made it a goal and an intention to post more content. I have been recording and capturing footage all 2023 because I don't want to have to keep up <laughs> with creating. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of stuff in the, in the, in the can that's going to be out and available for everybody to see, you know, early 2024. So Instagram and, and YouTube will be the place. What's your Instagram handle? Instagram, Brandon Commodore, at Brandon Commodore. I'll have the links in our show notes. And for everyone that listened to the episode, watched the episode on YouTube, I would really love any sort of feedback. It's still, you know, we're... Only a handful of episodes in, really, and there's a lot more to go. So your feedback is really valuable to me to decide how these episodes should be formatted, what kind of guests you want to hear from. I definitely read every message and every email. So please, if you liked it, subscribe, like, leave comments, that sort of thing, and just connect with us at Secrets from the Scene. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Yeah.